here. Uh, my name is George Bailey. I am the uh, Executive Director and Chief Research Officer for the Digital Supply Chain Institute. And I want to welcome everyone to this call today. We have an exciting discussion uh, set out for us. Uh, and you're all going to have a, a real opportunity to participate. So we've designed this collaboratory. And we call it a collaboratory because we want to create a spirit of collaboration between the different companies that are on the call today. That means an ability to talk and share and have ideas and explore the topics that are of interest to you. So um, we're going to begin right now. And uh, Vivek, if you could put up the uh, first slide, that would be great. Um, George, you can see it, right? Uh, I, I cannot see it, no. So we're just, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be live and in person in a second here. Oh, there we go. Now we're screen sharing. Thank you, Vivek. It's, it's going to, great. Just put it on slideshow. Excellent. Yeah. So, so again, uh, I, I want to really emphasize that this is a collaboratory. That means we collaborate. It's our seventh one we've done on the topic of coronavirus COVID-19. And uh, each one has been very interactive with a lot of discussions between the participants and the presenters. And we always learn a lot about what companies are doing and how to be more successful in these challenging times. So we set out three objectives. And uh, before I review them, I want to uh, say a couple of things about uh, the logistics of this. We're going to have a one hour session. We'll stick to that one hour exactly. Uh, we're going to have about 10 minutes per presenter. Uh, and then we're going to come back for a big Q&A session. So as you're listening, please uh, start thinking about what questions you want to ask, what issues you want to discuss. So uh, we'll go through, uh, I'll say a couple of things and we'll go through two presentations and then we'll have Q&A. So start right now thinking about what issues you have, what questions you have about COVID-19 and what companies can do. So here are the, the three objectives that we have for the session. Uh, number one, we want to outline the impact of uh, coronavirus on the global supply chain, especially uh, in South America and Japan. So you'll have, we have some great presenters that will talk about that. Uh, we want to focus on the business issues, the people impact, technology, everything that uh, this terrible pandemic is uh, touching and how the supply chains of the world are, are responding. So that's the first, first objective. The second objective is to describe what actions are now being taken um, across the supply chain. And we've got some great examples from uh, two very innovative companies uh, WAM and ChangeWave, and I'll explain uh, who, the, who they are in a second here. Uh, and then we want to develop some recommendations. By the, we, this is not going to be finished staff work, but we want, to, we want you to leave this call with some ideas that you can bring back to your company to help you uh, improve the performance of your organization. Uh, the Digital Supply Chain Institute, for those of you who uh, don't know who we are, we're a not-for-profit. We're based in New York, but we're global in operation, and we focus on the future of the supply chain. All right, next, next slide, please. Here's our, our agenda. Uh, I'm starting out. Uh, I'll make a few comments and then I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Laska. We, we're lucky enough to have two CEOs today. Uh, uh, I've met with Christopher before. He's an outstanding presenter and I know that he's going to give you a lot of great ideas today. I'm, I'm so I'm confident. I would, I'm betting money that you go away with some great ideas just from his presentation. Then we have We have uh, Sazaki-san, who's an old friend of mine from uh, Japan. She's uh, uh, probably the leading person in Japan on the topic of uh, uh, integrating women and men together in the workplace to get productive output. And she's also very involved right now with uh, how Japan's companies are responding to this pandemic. So she'll be, she'll be great. Another great presenter. You'll, you'll really enjoy hearing her. We've asked them both to spend 10 minutes only. Even though they, they, you know, they, could, they could fill up a lot of time, but only 10 minutes because we're going to start the Q&A at 9.35 a.m. Uh, New York time. Uh, that'll give us time to have a lot of Q&A, a lot of discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll finish up with some uh, observations and a closing summary, and we'll finish up right at 10 a.m. New York time. So that's, that's our agenda for today. And look at, look at your screen at the very bottom. Uh, there's a Q&A button. You put, the, you put your, Q, your questions in there. We will uh, make sure that they get answered. They'll, 
they'll, most of them will get answered during this session. Some might have to be answered later on and we'll, we'll send you something written. And we'll also send you a, a hard copy of these, uh, of these proceedings. Uh, we're also, by the way, uh, documenting um, the results and we'll, I, my phone just went up, sorry about that. We're also uh, documenting results and we'll send you a hard copy uh, when we're done. So that, that's the deal for today. And let's go, let's go to the next slide, please. Q&A and uh, chat, chat discussion, that's what we want. All right, so Vivek, uh, um, here, just a few things I wanna point out about what companies are doing uh, and what's happening in the world today. Uh, and all of you know this, but just to review the, the severity of this issue, the virus continues to spread. Um, we've had around, across the world about 13 million cases. We've had uh, quite a few uh, people uh, die, unfortunately. And then there's other issues with the, with the virus which affect not only uh, you know, living and dying, but also ability to perform uh, over time. Uh, it's geographically diverse. Uh, I have a few data points here that uh, I, th I think are right, but of course uh, our presenters will know better than I do. But um, uh, there's been about 22,000 cases in Japan, uh, 982 deaths. Uh, Chile, uh, unfortunately, has a very severe problem with a high per capita issue. Uh, 312,000 cases, 7,000 deaths. And of course, the USA, uh, we lead the world in this topic. We, we are absolutely uh, uh, incredibly uh, affected by the virus, 3.4 million cases so far, 138,000 deaths. It's quite, uh, quite severe. And it's uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're not talking today about the health impact or about the tragedy of the virus or the way it's affecting people's personal lives, but we are talking about how it affects supply chains. And uh, global supply chains in general are facing declining demand uh, in most cases. In some cases, high demand because uh, as the market changes, uh, you know, people's habits change. So, for example, the people who run Zoom are doing very, very well during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, other category airlines, for example, are not. So, um, but all of it's very uncertain and very hard to predict. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's true is Wave Two has not started yet. Um, but according to the health experts, at least in the U.S., they're saying that's probably going to ramp up in November. Uh, and, and the real question here for all of us is, are we prepared? We, we were not prepared for wave one, and we're still trying to get our, get our act together to become successful as a business, uh, as businesses to do this. But wave two potentially could be worse or potentially uh, will not be worse. We, we're really not sure. And we know that there's... Um, vaccines in the pipeline and there's a lot of good stuff happening, but it's very important to be ready for wave two. Uh, so we do a better job than we did for uh, reacting to wave one. Um, right now, the world economy is, uh, is, is uh, staying afloat and uh, government assistance has preserved many jobs uh, and, uh, and preserved some demand. So, uh, so we're, we're, we're sailing ahead, but uh, you know, it's troubled waters. Uh, next slide, please. I won't go through uh, uh, this slide in great detail. This is from uh, the, you know, the World Health Organization, but you can see that uh, a significant number of cases, uh, America is our hardest hit. Uh, and of course, uh, North America is, is, uh, is, the, is an area where we really, uh, we have a, a lot of issues right now with coronavirus and we're uh, working our supply chains globally to make sure that we can keep things running. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one example I want to give you, just because it's very, very visible to people, is, is how COVID-19 has affected work location, where people work. Um, in Japan, which, uh, you know, I, I live there and work there, uh, uh, and, you know, it's very much an in-the-office culture, uh, but not right now, not right now. So Zazaki-san will tell us about that. Um, I mean, I don't know what the number is today, but the last time I checked, train ridership was down 73%. So, the, you know, the, the massive movement that that you know, people who lived in Japan remember isn't happening. It's very, very different. Um, working from home in Chile, uh, highest per capita infection rate. Uh, uh, I don't have the numbers on it, but office workers are staying at home. Uh, and it's great diff greatly difficult for many workers who don't have that as an option. In the US, they, uh, uh, the statistics uh, say something like 77% of office workers are staying at home today. So you know, the majority, the vast majority, uh, staying at home. And uh, th this is just an example of how COVID-19 has affected a very fundamental thing about what you do every day when you go to work. Okay, so that's, uh, ne next slide, please. I'm going to introduce uh, 
Chris Verlaska. He's an amazing speaker and a great CEO. And he's running uh, one of the world's most exciting growth companies. So uh, Christopher, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. And uh, don't forget to take your mute button off. Get yes, I, I was going to say that. Uh, I don't know how I can even talk after your introduction. So uh, pretty high expectations. But I, I would say that uh, uh, thanks very much for this invitation. Uh, just very quickly, I, I'd like to just say a very few things about my company. And uh, on the first slide there, you will see that uh, we're a company that uh, came from pretty much nothing to a well-established uh, mobile telecom operators in the space of four years. We had, uh, was bought by a British fund and it was a small player focused on the business markets. Uh, they identified a few factors which was interesting in, in Chile. That was uh, the rule of law, GDP stability and growth. Uh, we can laugh a little bit about that now, but, but uh, especially at, uh, at this time, also very, it was enough competition, but uh, very high prices. And the uh, strategy of the company was to have a aggressive rollout of the network, uh, sales and distribution network. And uh, I would say rigorous focus on, on, the, on the customer always. And this is also why we always really focus on, on truly what customer wants. Uh, a lot of companies say that, but I can truly say that we really do that. And I'll come with a few examples in, in this crisis as well, what we've done. Um, and, uh, and of course, in the space of this time, we were very happy last year. It's that first time a mobile, mobile operator won the uh, three major customer awards uh, in Chile. And what is also very unique is that uh, uh, I haven't seen really anywhere in the world a mobile operator being the number one social media brand because we we engaged uh, truly with uh, as a people brand and uh, very early discussed uh, taboo topics in diversity uh, making fun some with early with politicians and, and others uh, on social media which is of course uh, risky but uh, creates a lot of engagement on the next uh, slide there you will see that um, in this uh, crisis, uh, as, uh, as George pointed out, Chile has been uh, very severely hit. Uh, the Chile, though, uh, implemented quite uh, strict rules uh, quite early. Uh, but I would say with the, uh, with the um, uh, general in, in Latin, Latin America, there is a big, uh, big uh, diversion between the, the rich and the poor and also how people live. And, uh, and, all, uh, and Chile thought we were doing pretty well, uh, both with established uh, mathematical models. Uh, I could also uh, collaborate with some of those who were running it from the government and look, look at the different methodologies. And, uh, and they were pretty similar from many other countries, but then it was really hitting uh, Chile a couple of months back and, and the figures were booming. Um, and, and that has, uh, has made it uh, really dif difficult for many people. I'll talk a little bit from our, our perspective what we've done, but as many mobile operators have seen around the world, also in Chile, the data traffic is, uh, is exploding in this kind of time and, and that's very logic as uh, people are staying at home, uh, having much longer sessions uh, and, uh, and of course uh, families, whether they are uh, sharing uh, network on Wi-Fi or, or cable, etc., in a house, uh, are getting a much more uh, challenged um, uh, quality. On the on the next slide, there uh, you would also see that uh, as many companies, uh, um, we adopted uh, some of the methodologies uh, in this sense that many companies around the world has done, whether it's from McKinsey's or BCG's, etc. Uh, as Chile has also undergone a social crisis uh, back in October, uh, I had also incorporated a, a, a crisis management um, uh, organization and process in the company as there have been a lot of um, risings, prost, protests uh, and vandalism uh, around the country and, and also around our stores, robberies, etc. Uh, so that's also a, a process that that is very key for any organization in, in my previous life when i worked in a 
global group called Telenor, I also had uh, both uh, training and, uh, and practical experience uh, at my time when I was, for example, in, in Serbia under the Kosovo crisis and also in Pakistan, not only under um, earthquakes, but also in terms of uh, terrorism and, uh, and also other crises such as reputational. And that became very relevant. Uh, so very quickly, I could ignite the crisis organization and assign them a PMO so that we could focus on what, what are the key actions we need to focus on in, uh, in this COVID crisis in terms of ensuring that we have uh, are strong in our cash flow position and that we can have a fast adaptation uh, to maneuver going forward. So that also that uh, when we plan, uh, we have no clue when that will happen, and I still don't, that we can, uh, can uh, invest in what's really important and that we can have a fast growth and come back to uh, the profitability levels that uh, our, our investors are expecting uh, post this situation, whatever that is. Fa fast forward communication is really key that we engaged and communicate uh, internally with our, our people uh, in the company, but also to the market and customers about what we are doing. And on the next slide there, you will see many examples and I, I will not go through all of them, but I would say very quickly when, when uh, our competitors very quickly uh, closed all their stores, uh, we spent a few days uh, with the retail teams to analyze what we could do and I also called some other um, ex-colleagues who are CEOs of companies in Europe because they were a few months ahead of us and they had the same problems that their employees, they were very scared uh, about uh, working in the stores because of the COVID. Uh, so we also had a lot of complaints and anger and uh, nervousness from our employees. So we, over the weekend, we came up with a volunteer program uh, of course, all the safety measure, measures that everyone has done in the stores. And we had the volunteer program of young people who don't have uh, uh, grandparents or live together with other families uh, so that they felt protected and, and could volunteer with the potential to get extra bonus. So that actually became a competitive advantage for us for a couple of months because we had uh, pretty much two or three times as many stores open as competitors. and and also with the uh, engaged personnel. So that's, uh, that's one example of if you have a good uh, crisis uh, PMO organization, you can actually take advantages. At the same time, we really looked at what are really the problems for, uh, for people and, and that is basically communicating. So we've been giving free social media uh, in our offerings. Of course, it's costing us and we made sure that all the Chileans that were abroad could also have free WhatsApp in the roaming so they didn't have to worry while they're staying abroad or actually be able to communicate. Uh, so you see a number of things that we've been doing there and over the last two, three months, we've been uh, ranked as uh, in the top uh, ranking and uh, as number one uh, in the Kantar survey as the most reputable uh, company in, in Chile during this uh, COVID crisis. And at the same time, we also see that in Chile, there's a big digital divide and we collaborated with an organization, it's an NGO called TECO, because there is a, a lot of slums in Chile and that's been increasing over the last few years. And uh, in a lot of these slums, uh, one of the problems is that the poor people cannot apply uh, to get help because they don't have internet connections. And this is also why we've been given, for example, not only to schools, but we gave a couple of weeks back 100,000 uh, chips, uh, SIM cards, so that uh, many of these slums could communicate and actually that they, in their community centers, they could have distance learning as uh, the community officers couldn't go to libraries and pick up books. So this, this is one of the things that uh, it's great as an operator that you can really help in the problems of the society. You can increase your reputation um, and, uh, and in the future help to, uh, with our business tools to improve the, the digital divide in this country. So on the next slide there, uh, you will see some of the topics that we have really prepared for uh, in this crisis. And, and one, uh, we are in a major digital transformation. And on one hand, we've been in the perfect storm 
because we are changing out all our BSS platforms uh, just in a couple of months now, but we have the best, best physical retail network in the country where we are really number one on MPS. But at the same time, with the limitations of stores we could have open because the, the health authorities uh, put a lot of limitations so we could only have um, emergency stores open. And of course, the productivity in those are not so good. There are queues uh, and safety. And then, of course, the customer uh, satisfaction is not so good. So what we had to do in this time is really look at first, how could we put up a lot of manual processes to prepare for our e-commerce uh, before we really go uh, digital uh, and Enzo Figetti who's here participating with us is, is responsible for logistics and we're really looking at how we can prepare now much quicker and getting there on the end-to-end -end solution as customers uh, want in terms of the experience of, of e-commerce which has boomed in, in this period of time and also to scale up remote channels like telesales and others, which we uh, in the past really have not been uh, so strong in. One other thing we already started working on in the, based on the social crisis in October is that our, our warehouse uh, was in, um, uh, let's say, a, a risky area. Uh, and we also saw then with the COVID crisis that it's a risk that um, the warehouse could be shut down uh, based on COVID, so we needed to redesign how you can split it uh, in case of uh, COVID outbreaks. So very practical things we've been working on and also uh, professionalizing the future warehouse uh, when we can open that so that we can uh, be much more effective, have automated processes. Many op mobile operators across the world really have a problem with this and I'm, I'm actually very excited that we can scale up and, and, uh, and uh, speed up our, our transformation uh, to get, uh, get a much more professional digital company. Also in this case, we've been speeding up uh, collaboration with the external market places. And at the same time, we're also renovating, modernizing uh, our, our shops, so we will have uh, renovated 60 stores uh, by September. So I will not go more into this because I, I get very excited and as you said, George, I could probably speak for two hours uh, non-stop about this, so I, I'll rather discipline myself because I, I said I'm, I, I see already that I'm one minute over time. Well, So Zaki-san, you're up next. Please uh, take us through your material. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, don't forget to take your mute button off also. Hi, so should I start? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Hi, um, uh, this, uh, this is Hiroko Sasaki. Thank you for invitations. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm not an expert of the supply chain management, unfortunately, but I'm, uh, I'm more uh, of a, a transformation designer. Uh, actually, I worked with uh, George, George uh, back in I think a decade ago to transform Sony. So let me uh, quickly um, to talk about who I am uh, briefly, and then also that uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to talk about uh, relevant to the supply chain transformation into COVID nineteen impact in Japan. Uh, what I do is to support people organization uh, to make successful first step ahead towards a new paradigm shift from the old. So I'm I really. Uh, bridge the gap between the old paradigm to new paradigm, and I'm I'm helping to design the transformation as a whole. So I'm a professional firm, uh, uh, the founder. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, could could you uh, next slide, please? Yes. Yeah, so what I usually do is the uh, the Japanese organization who are still in the old paradigms to really move forward to the new paradigm, which actually includes the, uh, of course, the diversity inclusion, new uh, culture, uh, new culture development, organization changes, as also the business model changes. Uh, what I do is to uh, just to help, they give them a hand to uh, 
make a first step successful so that they can kind of, you know, uh, go across the bridge by themselves. Um, and usually, and my, my work um, consists of uh, 40% diversity inclusion and uh, organization development, uh, 30%. And 20% of the uh, business development and uh, business model development. So, from that point of view, let me focus on a little bit more about uh, diversity inclusions, how COVID 19 has impacted that kind of area. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So um, let me touch on the COVID-19 and women leadership because I think it is very um, important for us to think about what uh, diversity inclusion can play the role to really restore the uh, businesses and also that uh, back, uh, also to re restart the new normal uh, for the better. Next slide, please. The inclusion of women leaders uh, in COVID-19. Here are the countries that I could think of um, who has, uh, you know, the countries led by female. They, they're the media's coverage uh, quite a lot that female-led countries were quite successful in fighting back to COVID-19, um, especially in New Zealand and Germany, who were, uh, who has a, a quite low death rate compared to the other countries, and also the, uh, uh, the successful lockdown uh, and, and by early decisions. And the question is why that happened. And uh, there are a few reports that support the uh, reason why. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I also had a, a data point from Japan, but, but, but because this is English, I, I, I kind of brought up here. Uh, this is the, the research survey done by the think tank of the US, uh, showing that uh, how women leaders and men, male leaders are uh, same and different and what kind of traits they're uh, quite, uh, they have. It seems like uh, women's are regarded as um, more compassionate and ethical and people oriented. And uh, as you can go see the bottom uh, and the risk of risk, but male are more um, are being willing to take risks than women, which is uh, quite normal and uh, quite um, uh, important for the business, uh, business development and the business, business decision. But uh, but uh, in the time of the uncertainty risk management, um, the, the, the risk averse trait uh, with the uh, ethical and social oriented, people oriented decisions may play um, uh, one of the pivotal roles uh, as one of the, uh, one of the important uh, elements to lead the uh, handling the situations. Uh, next slide, please. That also may apply to the supply chain transformation going forward. So because we, we know that we need a sustainability, uh, we need a risk management, uh, and that we need to control our uncertainty. And also we, also, uh, we need a social orientation and flexibility in uh, the collaboration in order to uh, be quick and adaptable, adaptable to the changes and the for foreseeable future. So basically that, um, well, next, please. So um, I'm, I'm just wanted to figure out that how the women leaders can play a pivotal role and how that the COVID-19 has impacted Japan on developing women leadership and empowerment uh, from my point of view. Let me touch on that. Uh, next slide, please. As you may have already known, the female on board and executive teams um, in Japan, uh, the number, number is far less than other OECD countries. Uh, as you look at the bottom, uh, Japan only have 3% of uh, female on board and 17% uh, uh, to figure out the companies with at least one woman on executive teams and, and we are quite behind uh, to uh, the rest of the world. 
and which is a big deal uh, to really uh, recover from the COVID-19. Although we, we don't have so many deaths to compare to the others, but in terms of the economic point of view, we have, uh, we have hit quite heavily. Like most of the industry uh, lost 30% of the uh, profit compared to the, uh, the uh, previous year. Next slide, please. And um, the situation is such, so I actually Googled the, uh, the word top management and executive in Japanese. Uh, and he, this is the images that Google gave me as a, an image photos. And I was very surprised to uh, see that you have to count like more than 60 photos until you find the first women leaders photo. Uh, on the screen. So that's the, uh, the image of the top management executives and uh, leaders in Japan. Uh, for change that. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the root causes is that um, uh, male, Japanese male workers are uh, quite famous for the most world diligent workers. Um, so that they really spend uh, much more time in work and, and, and they dedicated a time for the, uh, um, the, the developing their careers. Versus a female, although they are working, uh, they also focus on a work, uh, housework and childcare, so that they kind of hesitated to uh, climb up the ladder of the corporates and, and, and win the table. Um, table of the decision making process. Next slide, please. And this is re deeply rooted in the gender implicit bias. And this data is uh, actually scored uh, by uh, the, the tools that, I, that we developed. Uh, that this is the data from uh, the 3000 middle managers in Japan. And you can figure out the uh, how uh, the gender implicit bias are high in Japan. Um, this are, we, we can see a strong association between female and family and male carrier, so that uh, the, the brain automatically process that, you know, uh, when we see the male and female um, candidates for the hot jobs, you automatically, automatically and implicitly assign the hot job to the male versus female. That was uh, actually the typical uh, the typical situation that happens, the uh, women, women agenda inequality in terms of the leadership position as well as the experience that accumulated to uh, go to the next level. The next slide, please. So this is how uh, we were uh, before the COVID-19. But the good news is that uh, COVID-19 has impacted Japan in uh, somehow in a better way. Uh, in terms of the diversity inclusion and empowerment women for the leadership position. Uh, one big change is the work style changes of the uh, majority of the people, not only, only women, but also men, uh, men and uh, top management and middle managers, all of them. As George mentioned, uh, the, the Japanese uh, corporate working style is just, uh, we go to the office and every day and then work there and commute them and then mingle, that, mingle there and as a membership of the corporate. But um, as you can see, the surge of the remote workers uh, quite changed the situation and how we work and how we connect with the uh, office, how we connect with the corporates. Next slide, please. So this uh, has been the commuting uh, situation of Japan. So you, every day you work in packed commuting trains and then you go to the office with the suit. But this has gone uh, by COVID-19. Next, uh, next slide, please. And this is the typical uh, working style uh, nowadays under the COVID-19. So uh, the people work from home and uh, being together with families. So even the, um, you know, the male and women's, uh, you know, it, without, without differences, 
they contribute to uh, work and they will contribute to the housework and then they are their mind share of the life is uh, has been changed so the priority uh, lies uh, first in life and the second in work that that kind of change has happened uh, according to the data points next slide please this is um, the uh, quite a, a swing and shift from uh, my point of view I, because I, I've been dealing with that diversity inclusion for a decade. The husband's role increased uh, in the housework and childcare uh, by 26.4%, which is a quite sizable change with a very short time uh, in some countries like Japan. Next slides, please. And then even that, uh, uh, can you push the button? Yes. And then surprisingly that uh, because that they, their priority changes, um, they, they feel that the life is important and they, they move, uh, including myself. And most of the people started think, thinking about uh, changing the shift of the, how they work and how they live. So more than 50% uh, of the, the employees started thinking about changing career, not only the uh, women, but also the male and across the board, uh, across the, uh, the age bands so from 20s to six, uh, 50s. So which is a quite a sizable change compared to the uh, before the COVID-19 in our, in our country. The next slide, please. So, um, important that a uh, big shift has ha has been happening in um, corporate management and people management and how they uh, really live how they really motivate a people and retain a people uh, retain a talent uh, in a management point of view so we define a working style is of course you need I did, most of the the uh, major co Japanese corporates are uh, now now uh, setting the factor of uh, work from home, not working uh, in the office. And also how we communicate and connect is different. So we don't uh, social, well, we don't social physically, uh, we don't uh, work uh, physically. Um, and we define in a social management literacy is uh, also uh, raising the bar of the managers. So you, you have to handle the implicit bias because the most you, most of the people uh, um, uh, kind of understood that uh, they are different because they have a private life um, over the over the Zoom, and then they uh, they have to manage the whole life expectation and work expectation, and then how the how they comp uh, how to deal with deal with the uh, entire life, and you have to be very uh, uh, compassionate and you have an empathy to understand how the people are thinking about their life and work. That also uh, comes up to the uh, point that what kind of leaders are needed to manage the organization and lead the organization in the, under the COVID-19 where the people's lifestyles and priorities has totally changed. So if the women's leaders are regarded as more compassionate and ethical and people oriented, maybe um, a part of the leaders have to have that kind of uh, traits that are uh, very strong and as uh, uh, a diverse team. Next slide, please. So the major uh, companies, CEOs and the chairmen are also thinking about, uh, this is very important. So we have is rising, uh, where uh, that they have they they are targeting that thirty percent of the board member female board members uh, very soon in Japan. So they figured out that this is the time that we really need to accelerate women leadership empowerment. Just this, just because this is a critical moment to turn the business around, and this is the time that the diversity is needed. Next slide, please. And we see we also see the very surprising uh, appointment of C suite um, uh, last month. And the one of the very well known large companies appointed uh, uh, thirty uh, the very young um, ladies 
as a number two of the uh, of the board members, so CSO and the CHRO of the board members, and she's actually one. Of, she was one of the my uh, client, but um, the, the, it was a surprise. And then they they say they see that this kind of um, assignment is the the way to really survive in uncertain area uncertain age uh, in Japan. Next slide, please. So I can see the new paradigm has finally started. The I think the the polarizations going to happen in Japan um, between the corporates who really ride on this wind, or who really uh, miss on this wind. And um, I think that um, the women leadership problem, leadership empowerment and diversity inclusion might be very interesting uh, arena in. Uh, refining the supply and chain management going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Suzaki-san. And thank you, Christopher. That's a gr great and interesting presentations from different parts of the world and uh, really uh, a lot of impact on our supply chains as, as we move forward. So I want to move to some Q&A and uh, I'm going to call on somebody, I hope he's in the audience, uh, Felipe from Anastasia, uh, who's uh, from Chile. Uh, Felipe, uh, are you on the line now? Do you have any questions you, do you want to talk about with, or any observations you want to talk about with respect to the supply chain and uh, Chile? Uh, hi, hi, George. Yes, I'm online. Um, um, I, I was hearing um, the presentation of Chris and obviously the, the um, Hiroko. Uh, and um, I, I guess uh, some things that are, are involved in everything, and I hope that Chris, the, here this is that he was collaborating with the with the government in in, in, in tracking the the information coming from the from the telco or, or tracking the people from the COVID. So I guess that maybe he can he can explain a little bit more uh, how difficult it has, has been here to 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 collaborate with the government in, in one point and the other side collect all the all the data and 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 and, and, and try to help uh, to to uh, uh, Get the people involved on this on, on, on the on the COVID, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great uh, question, and um, and it, it's a big uh, challenge in Chile. As I worked in a global company before, I I uh, call I really collaborated with governments both in Scandinavia and Asia, and for example, could help the fighting with uh, with anonymous aggregated data in both Pakistan and ba Bangladesh when it came to uh, uh, malaria, for example. And, and of course, in COVID, uh, many telcos are collaborating. There's a, a company in Norway called Unacast, and they also collaborate in the US uh, with a lot of the data that's been used there with many authorities. The challenge in Chile uh, is that uh, both the history uh, of Chile, that people don't uh, trust uh, the government's use of data, uh, and in addition, there is uh, not uh, sufficient regulation and law in place. So I was quite early out to, to look at how I could help the institute who was doing the, the modeling uh, for, for the government. And of course, I asked as well, how, can you, how could I, in this case, uh, I mean, I was all prepared. It's not rocket science on how we could do it on the data, aggregated data. The trouble is that I could get no uh, assurance uh, and contract with the government uh, to do this. And as I'm uh, uh, responsible for this company and we have an owner, I couldn't do that. So that's slowing down the work uh, with, uh, for Chile. It's a longer story, but uh, wh what I do about it is that we're also members now of uh, an, an organization called País Digital, where there are also some of my competitors participating and also other IT companies. And uh, what we need to do, uh, not only this organization, is to, uh, to both collaborate with, uh, with the business and, and the government to, to look at how we could do this. And that is also needing a lot of testing, uh, communication. And I believe it's going to take time based on the social crisis that we are in Chile. It's quite Chile perspective, uh, specific. Uh, what, I, what I'm saying here. So I'll, I'll leave it uh, at that point, um, unless you have uh, some uh, additional question. I, I just also very quickly have to be tempted to say that Hiroko's uh, presentation was 
was really uh, interesting. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, what you talk about diversity and female, uh, my perspective is that uh, I don't think it's any special with uh, the COVID situation because all modern organizations who want to be successful, they should follow this, but they ju should just accelerate it based on the needs in COVID. As you say that female traits and diversity is giving companies uh, uh, very good uh, return on their investment and there are plentiful of, of studies on that. I also have to say that the com countries that you showed who are the most successful. They're also the richest OECD uh, countries. And I would say in, in Latin America, there's a lot of diversion between poor and, and rich. And the trouble that we see here is that uh, when, when the poor are getting hungry, they go out, they don't care about rules uh, or regulations. And, and that's also, in my view, uh, not, not the scientist, uh, leading to this uh, high explosion in, in many Latin countries or in Africa or other places in Asia. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Christopher. I, I, I want to keep going through some questions uh, here. There, there's a, a question, you know, I, uh, as Suzuki-san knows, uh, I could read uh, katakana and hiragana, but I can't read kanji, really. So there's a question from Tokyo. It's about, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's about, you know, how uh, does this testing issue affect the supply chain? You know, this question, question about uh, uh, how to get tested and how it works. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a question that applies in many places around the world, but but uh, do you have any comments, Suzaki-san, uh, to reply to the person from Tokyo? And I'm, I'm not, I, I, can't read it. I can't read his or her name, so I, I have to, I have to let, let you do that. Can you see it? It's in the Q&A section. Sure, sorry, I cannot, I cannot find the questions that you are mentioning. It's... Uh, okay, okay. Well... Uh, I'll read it to you. Uh, okay. We're experiencing a dramatic surge in the number of COVID-19 patients in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to test people uh, mm -hmm. and isolate those that are not healthy. What mm -hmm. do you think about the role of the test uh, testing process for the supply chain in general? And, uh, and oh, by the way, one thing I'll say, Saki-san, is in, you know, in Japan, there is a big issue with uh, making proper use of uh, female talent. It's uh, sure. well known. But you know, the truth is in supply chain, it's, it's an even, even bigger problem within business. If you look at most supply chain organizations, mm -hmm. uh, very, less diversity than ideal. But, but go ahead and answer the question from Tokyo, please. So the testing of the COVID-19 uh, PCR, are you mentioning? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we know that, um, you know, we, we haven't uh, tested so many patients, so many uh, potential PCR. But, um, you know, our experts says, and uh, I also uh, think that, you know, PCR is not uh, quite accurate um, as long as we, uh, we know. And, then, and when it comes to the PCR test, it's really our... Um, in an early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been a um, risk. It, there's a risk of, you know, being exposed by the other virus uh, by uh, going into um, getting a PCR test. Mm -hmm. So basically, that the, the based on the accuracy versus uh, you know risk that as potentially um, um, affected by by getting a PCR test. Uh, the the government has limited the the the, the people who should uh, get the test um, in terms of the risk management. So they kind of focus on the clusters that potentially um, um, you know uh, there's a there's a call the, there's a the group called clusters that they have um, uh, infected uh, the, a lot of people in a one place. So that they can, you know, really control that that the um, um, evaporation of the virus uh, based on understanding who have connected whom. So in order for us to understand the uh, who are the in the clusters, they have tested. That's what I understood. So basically, that uh, PCR test uh, itself, uh, number of a PCR test itself, um, may not be hundred percent. Uh, in terms of uh, understanding whether they, they, you are affected or not. So that, that's, that's what I understood. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And uh, every country has issues about testing. 
So yeah. it's a big, it's a big topic and uh, a big topic for supply chains as we try and ramp up and, and get demand going again and, uh, and supply. So uh, I have, a, I have one more question. I have a question from uh, uh, Jean Ruda uh, about profitability and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and I guess it's for either panelists or maybe Christopher will go back to you. Uh, he, he says, what about supply chain decentralization and a blockchain? where access to communication technology is verified and less costly. Any comments on uh, uh, supply chain decentralization or, and, and maybe this is something Enzo should, should answer, Christopher, you can decide, but, uh, uh, and, and communications technology. Yeah, I can let uh, Enzo give a question on that, but I, you know, I, I, see, I see, as I said before, I see a, a great opportunity to, now to, to step up on uh, uh, on our next steps of um, uh, transformation. So I think we're doing a lot now in, uh, in Enso's area in, in logistics. Uh, I had on my slide, we will have a new order management system uh, and also, also a new warehouse, uh, blockchain, etc. I think you know, we need to get some of the basics first and also how we apply BI and AI uh, in our business as well. Uh, but surely we want to apply new technologies as blockchain very quickly as well. But first we need to get through with our BSS transformation that we wanna have in place uh, within two months. Uh, and there's usually a stabilization period of a couple of months so that we can get that in place as well. I don't know if you have any additional comments and so. Oh, just, just remember that Chile is a long, narrow country four kilometers away, for four, uh, thousand kilometers away. It's like twice the distance between San Francisco and New York. And we have one roadway, one highway between the north and the south. So in order to reach the whole country uh, with those bunch of sanitary courts, uh, the, decentralization, the decentralization was key for us. Uh, from January to, to here. And the answer comes from the technology. The order manager, Christopher mentioned, is, was key for us in order to reach the country, decentralization, the inventory. Um, and that make, makes us possible to uh, give our customers what they need in order to access our services, the SIM cards, the handsets, and the open stores Christopher mentioned. So you're right, the, the, decentral, the decentralization is key in our case in order to pass through this situation. Uh, George, you have to put on your microphone, but uh, while you are doing that, uh, I saw another ah, great question from my very good friend, uh, um, Marko Kovacevic uh, there, on how, how you engage your organization in this kind of time. And I think mm -hmm. it's uh, nothing special in Chile. It's the same as I've learned from everywhere around the world, whether it's my great friend, head of Asia, uh, uh, Google in, in Singapore or others. And, and it's usually partly what uh, Hiroko said, that it's, you need to pay attention to the young single people. Uh, it's different uh, in, in Chile versus Singapore. But I, I think, you know, many examples that we think we, we couldn't do before, uh, we have done actually. So many, many of the things I said four months ago, I've done, I had a team effect, effectiveness, team building uh, with my team, two, three sessions. And it's the small things that matters as before. You can use your uh, delivery systems to deliver some boxes of food. Uh, I think we've had now many uh, big meetings. We have our top 50 meetings on Mondays. We are using digital tools like we did before, like Kahoot and others. And in this period of time as well, we've been uh, stepping up the efforts to use uh, uh, gamification tools uh, for all mm -hmm. our sales, uh, customer care uh, employees as well. So what has really surprised me that, you know, when we have been really focusing on the customers, we have of course the lower activity and sales, but actually our, the engagement uh, in our uh, employees uh, of our WOMERS has actually increased to my, my positive surprise. That's great. That's great. Uh, I have a question from Chris Kane from uh, CGE. C Chris, would, would you ask the question, please? Yeah, thanks, George. Uh, Christopher, good to see you again. Thank you for, for joining us today. Um, so prior to the pandemic, I'm interested to know what either percentage of usage from your customers or subscribers was made up by video 
versus just data and voice. And because as George talked about, uh, some industries are booming because of this pandemic, others are hurting dramatically. Um, and I just wondered whether within your business and your sector, the rapid acceleration of video conferencing usage like this, like Zoom, is a plus for WOM? And if so, does it usher in, in your mind, new, new value creations for your business model? Yeah, there's a lot of lot of good questions there, Chris. So I would say that the uh, the data increase has been sixty uh, percent this year uh, since January, and it's been booming booming since March. Uh, first of all, because as I said, people are using these kind of sessions much longer, not only on on video session for work or or distance learning. But at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, of course, a lot of Netflix and entertainment at the same time. So I, th I think this is pretty, pretty big. But at the, at the same, bit more complex and specific to the mobile industry uh, is is also that the, um, uh, the, the some some of uh, some players in the market has been arguing that there is really not so much need for for the new spectrum auctions for 5G to come. We've been saying the opposite because the, the fixed line fiber is really for the rich people in Chile. Uh, and, and what we need to do is to get these auctions going so that we could supply high quality uh, video uh, and services to the bigger part of population to make that digital, digital divide a lot smaller, whether it's for 4 or 5G. That's the big problem for Chile. And I was very happy earlier this week when the Supreme Court decision was making so that the uh, auctions will go ahead quite quickly. Uh, then, then Chile has an opportunity to be a front runner in Chile. And then to the next question, it will become a lot of new opportunities within IoT, telemedicine uh, and other services in Chile. And, uh, yeah, we, we have trials. We also have a collaboration with the startup Chile uh, uh, that we, we had already. Uh, so I see a, a lot of new opportunities for, uh, for startups uh, and, and small entrepreneurs in Chile, not only the big, uh, uh, big uh, players in mining and fisheries, for example. Great, thanks. Thank you, Christopher. Well, this has been a great session and we didn't get to all the questions that were asked. But we will get back to you afterwards with a summary of the remarks, the slides, uh, some uh, responses to the Q&A that, you, uh, that you've posed. And we'll make sure that everybody uh, uh, says a sense of closure around this. And I hope that all of you, when you go back to your work after this call, are, have got some new ideas that you can take about how you can cope with COVID, how you can get your supply chain to be world class and out delivering everybody else's and make your customers much, much happier. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been great. Thank you very much, Zaki-san, and thank you, Chris Christopher. Your presentations are always excellent. Uh, some great challenges about how do we get women to be effective in the work marketplace? How do we use uh, communications to increase uh, social structure and uh, communications within business? So great, great presentations and a great discussion. And uh, I'd like uh, to thank all of our guests as well. We're going to have another one of these calls coming up over the next four weeks, uh, and it'll be uh, an exciting one. Uh, so I won't tell you what it is yet because it's not all confirmed, but uh, we really appreciate your attending and uh, look forward to having you on our next uh, collaboratory. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you.